I know that you do um, your own segments, castrating the marks. I know that you go back and forth between watching stuff, not watching stuff, dealing with critics, dealing with fans, dealing with pretend fans and undercover haters. What would be some of your advice for people that are just getting into the business that have to navigate this new norm of social media and still trying to fulfill their dreams while coming to the realization that wrestling isn't how you watched as a kid? Taylor, people ask me all the time, how could I get started in the business? How could I write? And I don't mean to be a, I, you know, pardon my French. I don't mean to be a dick, but I cannot tell anybody, me personally, I cannot tell anybody with a good conscience, it, it's a good idea to get in the wrestling business. I mean, I just can't. That's why when people ask me for advice, I can't with a good conscience give them advice. Because yeah. I know, listen, I was, I grew up a wrestling fan, but I was not like a mark. I was a fan of wrestling, just like I'm a fan of music, just like I'm a fan of baseball. I was a fan. So there was never this lifelong dream of getting in the wrestling. I never had that. So the difference with me was, you know, I worked other places before wrestling. I actually worked for CBS. I worked for CBS before I worked for the WWE. So from day one, when I got my job in WWE, it was a job to me. It, it was a job. I had, I had, you know, two small kids at the time. I had to support my family. And from day one, when I was in the wrestling business, I looked at it as nothing but a job. And I'm <laughs> Tell you something when you've got that kind of perspective and then you enter like into this world i i to this day i call it the wrestling bubble and the reason why i call it that are you know the 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 laws and the principles and the morals that all of us share out here in the real world they don't exist in wrestling mm -mm. And I, that's why, like, I always remain the outsider because I never wanted to be a part of that culture. I look at it the same exact way today. You know, you you bring up like castrating the marks and the whole main reason why I do that show is. Man, you have some of these dirt sheet writers. You have some of these grown ass marks who like <laughs> the be all and end like it is an obsession and and i'm trying to tell them through comedy guys like this is wrestling like lighten up you are supposed to be entertained by this you're not supposed to be obsessing with this and putting every second of every waking day into this and you know what i say taylor and i know you'll appreciate this if you are obsessed with wrestling whether you're in the business or not if you're obsessed with wrestling, you probably aren't paying attention to the things that are important in your life. And those people are going to wake up one day and say, holy shit, like, what was I thinking? But at that point, you let decades and decades and decades. That's why it was a blessing in disguise for me when, you know, Vince McMahon, I don't even think I was 40 yet. Uh, uh, no, I wasn't 40. I was about 38 years old, 39 years old when he made it clear to me, uh, after all the hard work I was giving him after everything I did for his company, he made it clear to me. He didn't care about me and he didn't care about my family. And all it was about was his company and business. So at a very early age, you know, before I was even 40, when, when, I was hit with that realization, I was able to leave. Uh, whereas, you know, some people just, they they get trapped in that system forever. I, I don't know if you saw, but my gosh, it, it broke my heart a couple of days ago when I saw that page video. Did you see the page video? I did not. I actually only heard about it briefly last night on Halloween. So I um I only got you know the secondhand version of it. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm watching her and she's crying on her live Twitch stream because you know now they're making uh you know all the wrestlers, the independent contractors, you know, get off Twitch and she's talking about I broke my neck two times for this company and I started this community and this is my safe zone and you guys have become my family and this is where I go now. I don't know what to do. I mean, sobbing, like weeping. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, you are not a prisoner. Get out. You can get out. L- look at what you and I do. There are other things you can do in this business. But she sounded like such a a prisoner that had no other choice but to stay. And I'm like, gosh, get out. You don't have to feel that way. That even just hearing about it breaks my heart because I don't know about you, but for me, I have been in the business for about 14 years now um, as of this month. And 14? Yeah, 14. That's crazy. Wow. Oh my gosh. Oof. Anyway. <laughs> Um, you know, and not I have not met a single person that got into the wrestling business because they hated it as a kid or they hated it growing up. They all get into it because they loved it or they fell into it, but it was never because they hated it. But I cannot tell you how many people I have met that left the business and or are leaving the business because they now hate it. And that breaks my heart, you know, and that's why I always talk about on this podcast is like it's like the Wizard of Oz, you know, it. The great and powerful Oz is not what everybody thinks it is. The wrestling business is not what people think it is. It's geared towards children. It's not for adults to fulfill their childhood dreams in because you'll never be happy unless you learn to define happiness and success for yourself. People are a slave to a label and they don't they don't realize that they don't need the label to be successful. And you can still love this and find a way to leave it, still loving it, if you remember why you fell in love with it. And yeah. I just think we all get so lost. I know I got lost for such a long time, and I didn't recognize myself. Like, I I was Paige, you know, minus the, the broken neck, but I was Paige. You know, I have, like, six concussions, mm-hmm. maybe more. You know, I have lots of broke, like, I, I fractured my ankle. Well, not me. Somebody else did. Like, I, I got hit in the back of the head with a chair that wasn't supposed to hit me in the head. You know, there's all these, like, crazy things that happen and you do it because you love it brother you know but it's like um i'm glad you brought this up because exactly you are not a slave to a label unless you give that person power over you if you're an independent contractor and i wrote an article about this for fightful.com and i tried to look at it from both sides so i would love to hear your opinion as well the wwe looking at third party platforms and trying to restrict that that's not a surprise to me at least when that announcement came, that was no surprise. And for a lot of superstars that are signed and for a lot of fans, that was a surprise. And that in and of itself, I found surprising because it's like, guys, it, you, you're, you're, you're worship, worshiping superstars that are being paid by a PG program, a PG publicly traded company. Okay, that means they have PG sponsorships that they have to adhere to. Their their TV deals pay most of their budget. If they lose that, it's going to be very scary. Plus your other sponsors, plus your shareholders that you have to, you know, (laughs) satisfy and, you know, explain to. There's a lot that goes into this. But if you have a PG program that you're hired on as an independent contractor, but then all of your platforms are not PG that can hurt business, hurt the future of the company, it's really no surprise. However, I know for personal experience, we're not taught how to read those contracts. We're not taught in wrestling school 101 what the lingo is and why it's written in such a way and and why it's written. It may sound one way, but it actually means something completely different. And that's why it's worded this way. This is the language why they they refer to the party of the first part can fire the party of the third part without any explanation or reasoning behind it. I remember that was actually in my TNA contract. You know, did I understand that at 22 years old? I had to have someone read it and explain it to me you know um so a lot of these people are surprised but it's like well i feel like part of it is superstars fault but then part of it is a company's fault because like you pointed out and i just pointed out they are independent contractors for a reason independent is the first word in their job title so how much power should a company have over its independent contractors but also two independent contractors have to learn to say no with the realization that there are going to be other people lining up behind you to take that because they are willing to do what you aren't it's a very 
yeah. tumultuous situation for both sides, I think. I think, though, you know, th- th- there's so much that goes into this. And I mean, I, I've, you know, <laughs> I've I've been familiar with this for many, 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 many years. And I know the way the WWE system works because I was in it at a top level. Here, he, I, I agree with them on one hand, hand, but the true reason why they do it is something completely different. First of all, I think people have to understand, you know, this is a business. As a businessman, Vince McMahon is going to get away with as much as he possibly can. If, if, if he can write a one-sided contract that you're going to sign, why, why shouldn't he? I mean, it's it's business. Now, don't get me wrong. I was a boss, too, and I own businesses, too. I don't work that way. I literally, Taylor, as a shoot, I probably put myself out of business a couple of times because I paid my employees too much. That's a shoot. But that's me. With Vince McMahon, if he can make a contract one-sided and take away all your rights to do anything else – and you're going to sign it, then why shouldn't he do that? You know, at the end of the day, you're signing the contract. And what are you signing the contract for? This is the dream. This is what I, you know, so you're, you're signing the contract. Here, here's, here's the slippery slope, though. I don't think they give a crap about we're a PG product and we're afraid what other people are going to do on their platforms because all they got to do is monitor the platforms. And if somebody steps out of line, all they got to do is give them a slap on the hand, fine them, whatever they're going to do. Listen, you, you'll cost the sponsors, this and that. You can't do that. That's all they have to do. The reason why they are not allowing it is, first of all, I understand the WWE argument. Let's take Paige, for instance. I understand their argument. Their argument is, and their mindset is, we made Paige. We gave you the platform. Nobody knew who you were before we attached WWE to your name. So now you're out on on a a Twitch and you've got 100,000 followers, whatever money you're making. um, You would not be making that if it weren't for us. And you know what? I agree with that. They're right in that aspect. So to me, the right thing to do is, okay, up front, tell tell your superstars that if we're going to create you and we're going to give you name value, then we're going to get 20% and you're going to get 80%. I mean, you know, say that up front because yeah. – Paige would not be making what she's making if she did not have that machine behind her. So I I have no problem with them taking a percentage of that. But the fact of the matter is, Taylor, that when they see somebody making a lot of money outside of the WWE, they don't like that because now – All of a sudden, they know that person doesn't need you. Mm -hmm. Now knows they have options. They don't like that. So, of course, you know, they're going to try to put the kibosh on it. You're not going to do this anymore. We've got this contract that you signed, you know, game over. But like I said, you have the option to get out of the contract. I look at so many people that have done that and made it. You know, I look at somebody, you know, like you, you're still in the business, but you're not working in it full time. A guy like Ryback, you know, if you've got a head on your shoulders and you've got a business sense, you could take that name value that you created and you could make a very nice living without somebody having to own you. So many people have proven that over and over again. But if you want to remain a prisoner, well, you know, that's up to you. 
And that's the problem. I um I actually am so glad you brought that up because I brought up the same thing. You know, back in the 90s and early 2000s, we weren't necessarily in a social media world yet. We were on the cusp. So those superstars, once the WWE wasn't giving them those photo shoots, those magazine covers, those centerfolds, those commercials, those guest TV appearances and whatnot, they had no other ways of getting themselves back over. They didn't have the the Zack Ryder ability where they could make their own YouTube show and create a demand for themselves that superstars exploit today to kind of take control back, to raise their sales for their merchandise and things like that. You know, superstars back in the 90s and early 2000s, they didn't have that. So once the WWE kind of took you out of the limelight, you either had to wait until they had a new use for you that was hopefully, cross your fingers, a hit, or you were done. Nowadays, like you said, there's a, there's a shift in control. There's been a challenge to that status quo that may not be potentially in favor of the WWE, like what you were saying. You know, there may not be a you if it wasn't for us. If we didn't book you in that way that help, help not made you, but help make you a star. Because at the end of the day, you know, I think somebody could be presented with the perfect role, the perfect, you know, storyline, the perfect match, and they can still blow it because they don't have the talent to execute, whatever yeah. the case may be. So I do believe that you are you are right and spot on. It is a oh, it oh, is oh, a control. Kelly, keep this in mind too, and you you know this better than anybody. Keep this in mind as an independent contractor. Okay. You are not going to be working for the WWE forever. Therefore, Mm -hmm. you want to promote your name and your brand and your platform through social media because you're not going to be working for the WWE forever. And I I mean, I see how you do it. You've built an incredible brand uh, and you are out there. You are your own identity. And and that's the thing. Like, they're not going to be working for the WWE forever as independent contractors. This, they need that platform to constantly promote themselves. And that's the problem is when you're when I think when you're in a system like the WWE, you're not taught to bet on yourself, really. And you kind of have to have that mentality when you do go off on your own and try to build a solidified and unified brand that when someone sees a shirt without even saying your name on it, they know, oh, that's a Taylor Hendricks shirt or, oh, wow, that must be Taylor Hendricks or, you know, oh, wow, look at this tweet. That's something Taylor Hendricks would say. Whatever the case may be, you have to have that. Well, even if it's quiet, I'm going to bet on myself and build on myself. And, you know, in the in the silence, I'm going to build my own noise. I'm going to be my own hype team, my own coach, my own best friend, my own confidant, my own audience until the time is right when I can reveal my cards and I can reveal everything. There's a lot of people that they don't have that mentality because it was beaten out of them as a part of a system. I think because also, also Taylor, don't forget. See, like I like I, I know you from the certain the, the, the amount of times we've spoken. And I know you would never fall for something like this. There's brainwashing involved. They, oh, I was brainwashed for years, Vince. Yeah, they, they <laughs> make you believe without them, you're nothing. They brainwash you to believe you're nothing without us. And I, I swear to God, I guarantee you on that roster right now, I, I would bet 75% of the wrestlers on that roster believe them and are scared to death. Man, so many young, 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 young kids fall into that trap. So many. <laughs> It's the it's the it's the nature of the beast because I don't think it's just the WWE that does this. I think the entire wrestling bubble yep. has that Manson cult like mentality, and I I didn't realize that I was living that mentality since I was freshly seventeen years old when I started in the business, and that's terrifying. Like the fact that I'm moderately sane is it speaks volumes to what I've experienced, I've seen, I was brainwashed. Like we're all. Brain- brainwashed to a certain extent. Taylor, was there a point where the, 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 like your eyes were open? I mean, was there like, was there a, that there had to be a time where you said, you know, looked around yourself and said, wait a minute, this something ain't right here. What was there a, a, an awakening for you? Mm-hmm. 
yeah, um, I think that awakening started as a slow whisper that kind of just bounced off the walls, almost like a horror movie. You know, um, there comes a point in your life where you look in the mirror and you don't recognize who you are. Mm -hmm. And that was very scary to me because I, when I was 13 years old, I don't know, it was a very prophetic year for me. I don't know why I sat down and I was like, okay, Taylor, what are your dreams? What do you want to be when you grow up? What are all the things that you want to do with your life? And I wrote them all down. And I'm very proud to say that to this day, I've, I've completed almost all of them. And that's amazing. Yeah. You know, I, I just I love that. But I lost sight of that so terribly, so badly. I was so lost that I honestly didn't think that there was any hope that I would be found. And when I looked in the mirror, it, it, I couldn't I couldn't see this. This this didn't exist to me anymore. I didn't I didn't recognize what was staring back at me in that mirror. And that's terrifying. Yeah. That scared me through to my bones. And that was the wake, wake up. And that wake up for me was 2018. So if you think about that, I had already been in the business for more than a decade wow. at that point. So I was lost for probably a, an entire decade. All of my 20s, I was pretty yeah. much lost. Yeah. You know, I hated my 20s, but I'm living the dream, you know, yeah. but those whispers started in 2016 yeah. and kind of started becoming an echo in 2017 until finally in 2018, it was a deafening noise making me, you know, go blind <laughs> until I could finally see the light again. What it is too, like um, what what happened with me is you you have to start changing and playing the game, not because you want to, because you want to survive. Like ev everybody's playing this game, and if you're the guy not playing it and not calculating every move and not thinking every, you will get squashed. You will. That get was me. Yes. And but that that's what happened to me, too. And it came to the point that it's like, bro, like, I just want to be me. I don't I don't I don't want I don't want this facade. It, it's not about the money. It's not about the position. I want to be me. That's why I'm at this point I'm at now where. Like people actually say to me, oh, bro, you're you're bitter because you're <laughs> not working in the WWE and AEW. And I'm like, are you freaking crazy? The, the amount of freedom I have right now with with the brand, I don't want to be back in that world. I don't want to be back in that system, because if you can't be you, Taylor, if you can't keep your integrity, what do you have? Who are you? What do you have? Nothing. Nothing. Zero. And all the money in the world isn't worth that. All the money in the world. No. Um, and you can't buy integrity in a store and you can't find happiness and self-love, you know, yeah. you know, on a shelf. And, you know, I, I've seen so many people project happiness and being a good person and being kind. But it's like. You can't you, you can put on all the makeup in the world to be pretty, but you can't swallow enough lipstick to be pretty on the inside. And the business is full of people that don't want to take accountability for their actions. They don't want to look in that mirror and, you know, do that hard conversation with yourself. So they like to be the victim. You know, they should carry around their own body chalk. That's what I like to say. Yeah. You know, those aren't your people, but that's what the business is. And so when you refuse to give that power to somebody else, that power over you that no one else should have except you, right. you're, 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 you're signing away your rights, basically. And that goes for anything. You know, um, every single wrestling company has their own sort of semblance of control. And, you know, if you don't fit into that mold and if you're not willing to accept those, you know, restraints and restrictions, then you're not, you're not going to be there. And that's not a circle to be inspired. That's, that's a cage. You're yep. being restricted, you know? Um, and to me, that awakening that we're talking about was when I realized all of this and I was like, wow, this is why I never fit in anywhere. You know, this is why I always, you know, felt like I was the outside looking in and it's, it's why that, you know, things in my career didn't always go the way I thought they would go. It's because I wasn't meant to have those things because I didn't want to sacrifice certain aspects of myself in order to achieve them. I wouldn't be the little girl that I used to be wouldn't be proud of that. And so for me, that's the that's the biggest difference. So, yeah, would it be crazy to wrestle WrestleMania? Absolutely. Would it be crazy to, you know, 
reprove, you know, that, you know, Impact Wrestling made a mistake when they released me? Absolutely. Would it would it be crazy of me to go and win the Ring of Honor, you know, Women's Championship or, you know, go to AEW and have some crazy pillar matches? Of course. But is 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 that the end game? No, I don't want to be 75 hoping that somebody books me at a convention so I can possibly, you know, buy my meds. You know, that's not what I want for my future, you know. And I think a lot of people like what you were saying, they they start to believe all that bad stuff. You know, oh, I'm nothing without this 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 label. Oh, I'm nothing because I didn't have anything or I'm nothing because I didn't save my money because I never planned for the future because I was always in the now and the money was coming in now, yep. you know, so I can't leave. I'm too scared. I never wanted that. I never wanted those types of things. And when you hear you're bad or a POS long enough, you start to believe it about yourself. Yep. And so I want more people to turn that narrative around and be like, no, I am amazing. I am worth it. Just because the business is this way doesn't mean I need to be this way. I can still fulfill my dreams any which way I choose yep. as long as it's me doing the choosing. And yep. I, want, I want that for more people. Yeah, I do too. And that's, that's a great attitude. Every, everything you just said there is spot on. So I have a funny story. In 2008, I did my first ever seminar. I was one of those people that always wanted to learn from the best and learn as much as I can and brother and be the most well-rounded wrestler, always be a good hand so that I can always have a job. <laughs> So I used to go to all these seminars and the first ever seminar I went to, I was like 18 years old or something crazy, ridiculously young. Uh, I went to a Terry Taylor seminar and I remember I was the one girl revolution, Taylor Hendricks. And I was like the only girl at the seminar. It was crazy. I didn't know my hand from my elbow. And he put us all in a line that went to the seminar and he went down the line asking everybody what their finisher was. And this kid said, I don't know. And Terry Taylor lost it and put him in the middle of the wrestling ring and put him in a sugar hold. And that was the first, I'd heard rumors of that hold and there were terrifying rumors, but I actually saw it for myself. And the more he struggled, the more that hold worked. <laughs> Yeah. And so I was a couple spots after him. And then I was like, uh, 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 a uh, clothesline. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so for the rest of the day, that was my finisher, a clothesline. And I remember fast forward to OVW, like four or five years later, um, I did a clothesline in front of Rip Rogers. And he's like, oh, 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 look at this 11 inch python knocking down Rob Terry. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him. It was one of my, one of my times where I had a little bit of moxie because he always terrified me. I was like, 11 inches, <laughs> this is a 12 inch python. <laughs> right, but um, I remember supposedly, so this will be really funny to hear the other side of this story from you. Terry Taylor had mentioned that in the 2008, 2009 timeframe, when you and Dutch Mantel were um, kind of hand in hand booking at TNA Impact Wrestling, their women's division was so inspiring. You know, Hamada, Awesome Kong, Chantel Taylor, uh, Taylor Wilde, you had Rose, you had Sarita. You, oh man, so many amazing women. The women had like three segments or more on the show. They were some of the higher rated segments. They were all different, different gimmicks. They were amazing. Uh, it was so cool. So he pitched supposedly myself and another New England girl to be the, the naturals, like the female version of the naturals, basically. Uh, and he wanted us because we were all natural to go up against the beautiful people. And I was told that you shot it down and said, no, we don't want them because we're breaking up the beautiful people. Do you remember that? Because that would be hilarious. I gotta tell you something, Taylor. <laughs> I'm just, listen, I know I don't remember a lot of things, but I swear to God, this is the first time I'm hearing that. <laughs> I, I thought so. I, I swear to God, this is because first of all, I, I could tell you, for, first of all, I'm friends with Terry. Let's leave. Let's I'm, I'm friends with Terry. But first of all, I would not say that. And I'll tell you why, because to say we're breaking up the beautiful people. The difference between me writing TV and everybody else writing TV is I wrote TV organically. I wrote it week to week to week to week based on ratings. And based on who was getting over and who weren't getting over, I really had my my finger on the pulse of uh, what was drawing ratings. 
So like I, I, I would, you know, the, the beautiful people were ratings mm-hmm. would have never, you know, you know, I mean, you, you know, sometimes it was just velvet and Angelina, and then we had Madison in there and sometimes Angelina was on the, uh, but I don't think they ever broke up my whole time in TNA ever because they, they were successful. And like, I'll tell you, you know, tell, and, and again, this is something that, 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 that I did and nobody was doing back then at the time. It isn't rocket science. You get the ratings, you know, minute by minute, who's drawing and who's not drawing. So you give them more of what's drawing and you eliminate what's not drawing. So mm-hmm. every week I'm looking at the show, the women were out drawing the men. I'm sorry, guys. The, these are the numbers. I get paid based on the numbers. You get paid based on the numbers. And that's when, you know, I started giving the, 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 the women two wrestling segments, sometimes three. They were out drawing the men. Unfortunately, the men don't want to hear that. It is what it is, guys. The, the, the more people that watch this show, the more money everybody's going to make. So mm-hmm. whether it's the women, whether it's the men, makes no difference to me. But, I mean, I can tell you, I, I, I think if you look back of my history, I don't think there was ever a breakup of the beautiful people, ever. I don't, I don't think Angelina and Velvet ever went against each other when I was there. Yeah, I think that happened after you were gone and they started taking away from Dutch Mantel. Yeah. And that kind of seemed like the downfall of the division for a little bit as a female watching it because years later in 2012, when I got gut check, I was so excited. I was like, oh, am I going to be a part of this amazing division that, you know, kind of revived my love for wrestling? I was like, wow, look at Roxy Laveau go. Look at Gail Kim go. Look at Hamada. Look at Taylor Wilde. I loved Taylor Wilde. Mm-hmm. I was like, these are some killer segments. These are some amazing matches. So Bull, I was like, I want to do this. So then gut check happens like, oh, wow. I think it's my time to get to do this, but it was a completely different ball game by that point, just a couple of years, but it made such a difference. I remember as a nobody, I got a 0.97, I think rating. And I was the second highest on my segment. The only person that beat myself and Lisa Marie Varen on that first half of the show was their champion, Austin Aries at that time. Yeah. And I was so proud of that. I was like, I'm a nobody. And look at this, almost a million. I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> oh, so, so what happened with your uh, TNA run there? What happened? I honestly just don't think I was supposed to be signed. I think that, you know, the crowd is what got me my contract. And I didn't find that out that day. I found it out from somebody in the office later on. Um, So obviously a lot of what I heard, whether it was my critiques about my body or my critiques about my career, it was always secondhand passed down from management. You know, I was too low on the totem pole from management to be more hands-on with me. Um, But, you know, I've never lied. Everything I've always said was true to what was said to me, you know, but people don't, people don't want to hear the truth. Lies fat, uh, spread faster than the truth. You know what I'm and, saying? And, and people definitely don't want to hear the truth in wrestling. Absolutely. No, they if don't. Being truthful w- will not help you. No. And, but the thing is, is like, to me, it's like doing the right thing is always re- the right thing to do, regardless of it, whether or not it's popular or trending. Like that's just who I am as a person. Yep. And so for me, I was so excited to be signed. You know, I remember that was like my first standing ovation. I remember the crowd at the impact zone was so loud and I couldn't believe it. I was like, I'm just this little recently turned 22 year old out of Massachusetts. And look at all these people in Orlando, Florida, cheering my name that had no idea who I was before yeah. I came out for this match. Yeah. You know, that was so bizarre to me I was like you know and I and at that point I still felt like a, a little girl on a roster full of women I didn't know how to do makeup I, d- I hadn't grown into my own body yet I didn't know about what colors look good on me so I'm wearing all these neon colors trying to be a baby face on their program but I'm a heel in their developmental system yeah. so that was very interesting when you know you have to go to OBW TV and have people booing you but then whenever the opportunity arises to go on TV you have to get them all to cheer for you yeah. uh, so that was always very interesting um God, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm almost just wondering now like i don't know like that i don't know why terry wouldn't have pitched it i don't know but i mean i i know like i i never broke up the beautiful people 
I just always thought that was a fun story. And I always said, one day I'm going to work with Vince. I said this, I was like, one day I'm going to work with Vince Russo and I'm going to ask him. <laughs> well, here you are. And you're, we're, working, we're working together in the best way possible. Yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of people are surprised because I was very bitter for a long time about that TNA experience. But now I can look back and I'm happy about it because it took me this whole journey to realize what that lesson was teaching me. I, ha I had something to learn. Yeah. And I had to I had something to grow from, you know, the best books aren't just an upward, you know, triumph. Oh, There's absolutely. all these dips and twists and turns. And, you know, you know, life isn't fair. It, life is rough. So you've got to be tough. You know, that experience was rough and I wasn't tough enough for it yet. Maybe I was too naive. I needed I needed a mama bear. I needed someone to take me under their wing and tell me what's up, you know, and, you know, hey, Taylor, you know, you, you put on a few pounds since your debut. What's going on? You know, oh, well, you know, my doctor told me my, my pre-cancer status is back. So I need to put on a little bit of weight. You know, I didn't I didn't have experience enough to tell management that because I didn't know you know I also didn't know about you know wrestling gear and what styles look good on your body and I was caught up in people telling me you know you got to be tan you got to be tan and you know I didn't know that you know I shouldn't go to any random hairstylist because they could possibly mess up your hair what did they do they messed up my hair and then people were mad at me that my hair wasn't bright red like my debut and I was like well, it's supposed to be, but the person messed it up, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, I remember wanting to be this like uh, Boston, Irish, punk rock, Scottish sort of girl and really represent Boston. Yeah. And I was so stoked. I remember I reached out to Green Day on social media and they put me in contact with like the, the PR people that kind of hold the rights for a lot of their stuff. And yeah. I remember that they were interested in letting me have the rights for six months for She's a Rebel. Oh, and wow. I was That's so cool. stoked. I was like, could yeah. you imagine Taylor Hendricks coming out? She's a rebel. She's yeah. a say. Hey. It would have been so cool. And that's when people saw me come out to some weird bagpipe music. I'm like, what is this? It sounds like I'm going to a funeral, yeah. but I'm supposed to be, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people don't know that, but yeah, that happened. I was like, what is this? I'm supposed to be like some spunky underdog baby face and I'm coming out to funeral bagpipes. <laughs> what is this? Yeah, that, yeah. That, 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 that's what's gotten away from wrestling too. Like really letting you guys like be yourselves. They, they, they've gotten so far away from that. And I don't, I don't understand why, man, it, it was so easy for me to do my job, just doing it organically and everybody letting everybody be themselves magnified a million times over, but they were comfortable in their own skin. I don't know why wrestling has gotten so far away from that. See, one of my idols is Betty Davis. And I always wanted to be like the Betty Davis of my generation, right? And I remember something that she said in an interview. She said, she was basically saying it's easier to play something you're not. And she was like, that's why all the good, uh, the good people in movies are all bitches in real life. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, it's really true. Like I've always found it so easy to play the bad guy, play the heel. You know, I think some of my most creative stuff came out of having no direction at Ring of Honor. I yeah. had nobody guiding me and telling me what to what to do right and, and how to do it. I just had my own instincts and what was hot at the time and what was not being done and trying to morph that into my own visions of things, you know. Yeah. And that was when I had my release of all these promos that I had written and done. I remember I sent some to you for feedback and stuff and I was like, this is this is what I'm supposed to do. This is this is this was what was missing. You know, we need more people that want to be gritty and yeah. get their hands dirty and this creative like plug the creativity back into wrestling. It's not just about all these moves that most fans can't relate to because they've never set foot in a ring. They don't know how, you know, a corkscrew moonsault feels, but they do know how getting punched in the face feels, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember reading something that kind of changed my perspective about wrestling and it was about John Lennon. And I love John Lennon. And he said that he had an assignment when he was five years old. And he remembered his mom telling him when he was growing up, when he was very, very little, that the secret to life is happiness. Mm -hmm. That's what she said. And so one day when he was like five years old or seven years old, he had an assignment from his teacher in school. And the assignment was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I know most of us have had that question given to us by multiple people in our lifetimes. And he wrote down that when he grew up, he wanted to be happy. Wow. When he got the assignment back, his teacher said he didn't understand the assignment. 
And John Lennon replied, no, you don't understand life. And <laughs> that was just so thought provoking to me. I'm like, man, what was I doing at five to seven years old? Not that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that kind of changed my whole perspective on, on everything, yeah. whether it was wrestling, whether it was writing and I love to write, whether it was producing or just my day to day on how I talk to myself, yeah. which used to be so toxic from everything. And now it's like, oh, self-talk is very important. You know, defining your own happiness and success is so important. Learning to be free with your authenticity, it all matters. It's, it's so important.